One, one commentator commenting on that section in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi said this was Paul's magnificent obsession to know Christ. And we tend to respond to that, well, gee, Paul had, by the time he was finished, he'd written half the New Testament. And Philippians, by the time he writes Philippians, he's only got 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy left to write. Didn't he know Jesus? <laughs> Paul would tell you, well, I know him, I knew about him, now I know him, but knowing him what makes me want to know him more, more. Turning your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, we read for our responsive reading the first portion of that. We're going to pick up and read uh, the rest of that, verses 12 to 21 as we as we think this is my first time to get to preach to you and to be with you in 2016 I've missed you you've been under good care though I've been following the messages preached here I want to say quickly before we get into the text just again how much I appreciate the folks in the media booth if you're ever at home and you can't get here to church for whatever reason, you're sick, you're caring for someone sick, something's happened, you've got an ox in the ditch you've got to deal with. And you have access to Wi-Fi, and you can go to BethelOwasso.org and come down the page, and there's a, there's a little link that says, Watch Live, and it's time for the service, and you click on that. You're going to be introduced to a very low budget but high highly skilled presentation of our services when the songs are being sung the the the, the microphone sounds the, the the eq and the and the whole thing is a good eqing the the lyrics to the song sung are down in the corner of the screen when the scripture is read the the passage of scripture is in the corner of the screen in other words you can participate at, at whatever level you want to by simply observing what's going on through our live stream broadcast. And then those, those sermons in both audio format, uh, through Sermon Audio, and in video format through uh, YouTube, we have a YouTube channel, they're all archived. So if you miss one, if you're out of reach and can't see, you can go back and watch the archived service. And I just am so thankful for that. I don't know how you get when you have to miss being in church but, but my soul is starved you know there's a lot of options out there on the TV and you can flip through and, but they're not, as, they're not as predictably theologically and biblically solid as what you're going to find here in my absence and when I'm here because we put prime emphasis on that uh, but I just challenge you to take advantage of it and I, and I thank God that, that was available to me I fed my soul daily from the word and through various means but it was good to have my soul fed in the context of my family of faith and I thank God for that Never take it for granted. Folks in the booth, I hope we never give you the impression that we take you for granted. You have a challenging task. In the audio section, the only time anybody notices you're there is when the audio messes up. Which means 99% of the time, they're there and nobody knows. But the fact that you can hear so well is a, is a tribute to the folks working in the, in the media booth to, to give you a good experience here and to make it available to anyone on planet Earth. And that excites me. Well, 2016, there's one thing, one thing we must do. Now, clearly, there are many things that must be done in 2016. But I want to look at this passage where Paul continues 
his thoughts from what we read in our responsive reading in Philippians 3, 2 uh, through 10, I think was it 11. And we will look at Philippians 3, 12 uh, through uh, 20, 21. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would as we read the Word of God. Paul has just talked about this magnificent obsession. I, I want to know him. I want to know the power. I want to ex experience that power in death to him, power in resurrection from him. I want to attain to the resurrection of the dead. What are you saying there is I want to I want to live as a man who who once lived another way and died and came back to life. I want you to know me as a newly resurrected man. He goes on to say, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward toward what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. You see, when Paul finishes this third chapter, he's still thinking about power. He's still thinking about power. Resurrection power. I've told you before that in foreign lands where our missionaries take the gospel, they have discovered and they report back to us that they don't convince or impress any foreign uh, religion, practitioners of foreign religion, with their knowledge, with their constructs, with the way that they articulate truth. What impresses foreign religions, and I will submit to you what is going to impress this post-Christian, neo-pagan society we live in today is power. Spiritual power. So we need this one thing. Now I've just read to you what? What have we read from here? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Let us treat it this way. That we have enough told us here to know and be given our marching orders for the year ahead. God bless you. Please be seated. So, the Apostle Paul going to teach us some things in this passage and I want us to think together about them for the few minutes we have together you know it seems to, to, to me at least that we just blinked our eyes and 2015 has gone and 2016 is here uh, and if you're like me the older I get it seems like uh, time flies faster and faster you look around at a house full of grandchildren and you think how can that one be that old how can uh, this one's coming up on another a fourth birthday uh, how can that be 
And so because time flies, it seemed to me good for us to just stop and reflect upon time past, time present, time future, as we're instructed by Paul to do that. Because you see, this one thing, and really anything that involves our lives, is a part of that whole collective where we're told that we're going to be giving an account one day before God as stewards. Stewards of time. Stewards of possessions. Stewards of opportunities. Stewards of gifts. Stewards of kindnesses. Stewards of graces. Stewards of difficult providences. We'll be giving an account. Now when you look at this writing of Paul, this letter to the church at Philippi, depending on which chronology of Paul's writings you, you follow, there are a few out there. I think, I think the best by the most conservative scholars puts this letter of Paul to the church at Philippi, written from Rome while he was in house arrest. He was, he was there for house arrest for a couple of years where he, he still had freedom to preach the gospel, he had free to write. People could come and visit him, and you, and you read about that in the book of Acts, where folks would come and, and he would preach to them in this, under this house arrest condition that he had in Rome. It would, get, it would get worse for him later, where he would be imprisoned and ultimately executed uh, by Nero. But at this point, when he's writing this letter and some other letters, Philippians falls, it seems, about the f fourth to the last letter he writes. And so when we hear him say the things he says, Remember, it's a, it's, a very, it's a very mature Apostle Paul. This is, not, this is not young Paul, recently going by the name of Saul, writing to the Galatians, churches in Galatia. This is a mature Apostle Paul. He has written, by this time, we believe, nine uh, books of the New Testament. He, he wouldn't have called them books. They were letters. He wrote them as letters to, to different churches, letters to individuals. He would finish out his writing, writing to three individuals, what we call the pastoral letters, the, to, to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy, where he's writing to Timothy as a young pastor to, to do some things in the church. He would write to Titus to do some things in the church and to Timothy again. We've gone through that study together. This is, the, this is Philippians, a church at Philippi, whom he loved greatly, he commends them for being one of the most generous, kind, caring congregations that he had had the privilege of encountering. He's concerned because there's two ladies in the church who are not getting along and it's, it's spilled out into a controversy and folks are taking sides and that concerns him. But what he writes here, he wants them to know some things. And I, I just want to give you five concerns that we'll, we'll just briefly look through today. First of all, he, he has a right assessment of himself. So, so we should have a right assessment of ourselves. He has a, a right perspective on life, and we need to have a right perspective on our lives. He takes a realistic look at the necessity uh, for sanctification, for growing in grace, and we need to also take that realistic look, that necessity. He, he makes an observation of a very sad, a really sad reality that's happening in the church with people he loves, perhaps people that he had led to Christ, perhaps people he had grown near to, maybe he had labored with. Finally, he gives a redemptive reminder of where we belong, of our citizenship. And I want us just to see these things briefly and hopefully capture that, that one thing, the essence of that one thing. And the one thing spreads out with many sub-things, but that one thing. My prayer is that as we leave here today, there will be a renewed focus in my own mind, my own heart, and yours as well. If nothing else happens this year, this one thing, this one thing I must do. I must make it my aim. I must make it my goal. So first of all, there's this need for a right assessment of ourselves. Look at, look at verse 12 and into verse 13. He says, he's talked about in the previous verses, I want to know him. I want to know the power 
of his resurrection. I want to be conformed to his death. He was crucified. I, I want to die. I want people to say, Paul died just like Jesus died. Paul died for the same reason Jesus died. That's, that's pretty serious stuff, folks. Peter had a similar magnificent obsession. He, when he was about to die, he said, they wanted to crucify him. And he said, don't crucify me like Jesus. I'm not worthy to hang in the same position my Savior did. And they crucified him upside down. So, in love with Jesus, was he? Paul has this magnificent obsession, but when he's said it, he does not want the people at Philippi to think that, that he has somehow arrived. See? That's not it. He's not telling them, I hope you guys can, can get where I am one day. That's not it. That's not what he's telling them. Listen to this. Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I, I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do. You see, he does not imagine himself to have already obtained. He uses this, this term. Maybe for a little help from that, you can look at 1 Timothy 6, verse 12, and again in 1 Timothy 6, verse 19. In 6, 12, he says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That take hold of eternal life. It's the picture you're going to get here is you have been gripped by the grace of God. And your sanctification in the days you have left here on this earth is to grip God himself. To lay hold of him who has laid hold of you. Again in verse 19 of 1 Timothy 6. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. The picture of the Christian should not be going through life with, with someone who has got them by the nap of the neck, bringing them along as they dangle and kick. And, you know, it may be that for a season in, in, in the life of a young Christian. It may even be that that recurs in the life of a believer when a difficult providence comes and it just seems to send you in a tailspin. But the, but the goal of the Christian is to, is to grow in grace so as to lay hold of and that's, that's a mind thing. It's knowing God. It's knowing Jesus. It's knowing truth. It's knowing grace. But it's a heart thing. It's laying hold of. It's, it's drawing to the bosom. It's, it's not. It goes beyond Jesus is my Savior. It goes into He is the fairest Lord Jesus. No matter what you bring to me. You say, well, what about the sun the stars? Oh, He's fairer than all of them. But what about the beauty of the... Med oh... He's fair because He's the creator of all of them. They are simply a mere reflection of the beauty of this creator, Savior. And so you're laying hold of this. Paul does not imagine himself to have already obtained. He hadn't arrived. Let me tell you something. The worst thing that can happen to a person in their Christian life is to think they've arrived. Well, I've studied the Bible X number of years. I've taught Sunday school so long. I served as a deacon so long. I've pastored so long. I've preached so long. I've been a missionary so long. I've been a church member so long. I've given so long. Yes, and? Your point is? You haven't obtained. You haven't graduated. You know when graduation day is for the Christian life, for you? Now, we don't know the date, but you know when it is? It's when Jesus takes you home. <laughs> but, but it's like you're graduating from elementary school into university because in, in eternity you're going to be ever learning, ever absorbing. Now with a glorified mind, completely unfettered, undistracted, not getting weary, ever taking in the godness of God. Paul said, I don't think I've obtained. And he says, I'm not already perfect. 
You talk to people like I have, I'm sure. I'm talking to them maybe about sin, the ravages of sin, the need to confess sin, to repent of sin. Sin is mixed in all that we do, even as believers, there's always a place to repent, confess. But I've talked to people and they say, well, I'm not perfect, but, and when they tell you that, deep down somewhere they believe they're almost perfect. I'm not perfect, but at least I hadn't killed anybody. <laughs> really? You've never been angry with somebody without cause? Well, I'll get angry. Wow. Jesus, Jesus teaches the Ten Commandments a little differently than maybe you remember them. So you're sinfully angry with your brother, you've murdered him in your heart. Paul says, I'm not perfect. Rather, he recognizes the need to press on. And this word for press on is really fascinating in the Greek. If, if you look at some different places in the Acts, uh, we're talking about the Christians being persecuted, it's this same word. Paul takes a word that you would typically say, use to say, I'm persecuting. And that's what he did. He persecuted the church. He was, he was intensely pursuing the followers of the way to catch them and then either jail them or, or have them stoned. And he says, that same attitude I had towards stamping out Christianity, that's the attitude now that the Spirit indwells me that I have for laying hold. For Paul, it wasn't passive. He, he, would, he would never have taught, well, let go and let God have his way. Paul would have said, surrender to the Lord means that you're fully engaged. That as you give over to him, you give him everything, your energies and everything to be spent for him. And so he's, he talks about this pressing on. He's going to use it again. He recognizes the importance of making it his own. That I may, that I may make it my own. What is this It. It is a sincere commitment to the gospel that goes beyond head knowledge and mouthing agreement to a vitally engaged life for Christ. I, could, I would submit to you the longer a person lives as a Christian in this culture, the easier it is to become, com uh, to become passive and lethargic. We don't live in a place where the knock at the door on Saturday night might be the police arresting us. We don't sit in here on, our, on the edge of our seats wondering if someone's going to come through the door and haul us off or the authorities coming through. So you, so you don't live the safety of Christianity on edge like many believers do around the world. And so passivity and lethargy can set in. But you see, with that framework, you won't obtain it. He, he acknowledges that this intense Christianity was the inevitable response of someone who was convinced that Jesus Christ had done everything necessary to make him his own. He says, I want to make it my own because Christ has made me his own. The picture that comes to my mind is that of, a, of an orphan. One of the most tragic sights to see is an orphan who's growing toward adulthood. They've hit their teenage years and, and now they're not grateful that mom and dad took them when, when they were rejected, when they were left abandoned. Uh, they, they become resentful. They become, uh, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. They become contemptible. But the picture that you ought to have here is of an orphan growing up who says, what are you doing? He says, I'm doing everything I can to, to show that my last name is such and such and to take that name and honor that name because my parents took me and gave me that name. Paul says, I'm doing everything I can. I don't want there to be any doubt that I'm a follower of Christ. In fact, there was not much doubt. The only, only place there was doubt expressed that he was a follower of Christ was in the congregations he sought to join. 
<laughs> they were the ones who wondered. Well, we, we, heard, we heard he just, we heard Stephen was stoned and Saul was there. I mean, now you're telling us to receive him into the fellowship. <laughs> we were hoping he wouldn't find us. But his, his, his Jewish friends, they had no doubt. Some of his fellow Pharisees in training, his peers, took an oath that they would never eat again until they had Paul's or Saul's head on a platter. Now all I can tell you is that they either broke their oath along the way or there was some dead student Pharisees somewhere dying of starvation. But they were that intense about it. The religious leaders, the, the pagan leaders, they didn't have any doubt. They saw him variously as a, as a blasphemer who had turned his back on Judaism. They saw him as a traitor. They saw him as a troublemaker. These people who have come here and turned our world upside down, they called him. You see, he wanted to be so obviously a follower of Christ that it would be clear to any who would stop and listen and consider that Christ had indeed taken hold of him. His thinking was... Christ has laid down his life for me. I cannot yawn through life when it comes to things eternal. Another thing is he freely acknowledged that he had not yet made it his own. And he, he said, I want to, but I haven't. Brothers and sisters, if the Apostle Paul, who was completely sold out to Jesus Christ, wrote letters that became half of our New Testament, was beaten, shipwrecked, snake bit, left for dead, possibly dead even, when you read the text in Acts. When he says, I'm not there yet, then none of us should ever be so naive as to think we arrived. <laughs> so what that means, that means that our journey on this life, while God gives us life, is to be intensely committed. This, this uh, what you're going to see, this picture here in a minute, Straining and pressing. No place for passivity. He boldly asserts that he has distilled his Christian walk down into this one thing. Let's look at this second thing. There's a right perspective of our lives. Here's this one thing. And the one thing involves the past, the present, and the future. He says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I am presently, currently pressing on, there's that, there's that persecute word again, toward the goal, he has a goal set, which is attached to this prize, he calls it, this, this, this reward at the end of the race, for the upward call, in some of the translations, for the high calling, it says of God. It's, that's, that's not entirely wrong. But it's better nuanced, the upward call. It's calling us upward. Life, life calls us downward. Our enemy says, stop, wait. Think about it. Don't get your hopes up. The enemy of my soul and your soul would love for us to each plunge headlong into some scandalous sin that will ruin us and wreck our reputation. If he can't get you to do that, you know what he wants you to do? Stop. He can even cast it as being sanctified. You need to... I remember it's been times even here when we've talked about things and initiatives and we're among leadership and gotten what we think is a clear direction to move and, and lo and behold, somebody who's supposed to be a leader uh, pops up and says, well, shouldn't we pray about this more? And it sounds so spiritual. And you want to, you, but I have been praying about this, and we've been in groups that have been praying about it. Or, or you've just gotten behind on your prayers? Are you wanting us to wait, let you catch up with us? What's the message here? The enemy of our souls wants us to stop. Because if he can get us to pause, to freeze, he can get us to go into a, a lethargy. Here's, here's Paul's approach to Christianity. Forgetting what lies behind. That's, he, has, he has a redemption reflection upon his past. He didn't forget everything. If you read the book of Acts, all up to the very end of the book of Acts, he is telling his testimony. He never forgot the fact that he was Saul of Tarsus who 
crucified Christians, who had Christians stoned to death, who was stamping out the way, this, this, this movement following Jesus Christ, alleging he had come back from the dead. He never forgot that he did that. It, it broke his heart to the very end of his life that he could do that. He never forgot the great grace of God that encountered him on the road to Damascus that stopped him and knocked him out his animal. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and in shock, he responds, who are you, Kurios? <laughs> Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Who you're intensely pursuing. The same word he's using here. And Bill Askell's paraphrase of that encounter is, Jesus basically says, Don't you know, the harder you kick against me, the more you're going to break your toe, your foot, your ankle, your knee, your leg. You're going to break yourself on me. Saul. He never forgot that great, gracious invasion. That when he deserved death, he was given life. He did forget some things, however. Uh, he, he re you read about them in the responsive reading. He rattles off this pedigree. Whoever says that they have the right to appeal to their pedigree, I have more, he says. My pedigree is more impressive. And he, he lists some things that are pretty impressive. He was the top student of Gamaliel. He was the one, the one in all of the rabbinic schools chosen to take on this, this heresy that was, had erupted where people were saying that this Jesus of Nazareth, this carpenter who claimed to be a Messiah, had risen from the grave. And they were going all around telling people that. And there was this movement underfoot and people were turning from Judaism. Priests were, were turning away from Judaism. People in Caesar's household would ultimately turn from their secular ways and embrace. And, and Saul of Tarsus was assigned the task, a task that they thought he was up to, and a task that had he accomplished it, would have made him the most notable man in Judaism. Those were what you would call the good old days for Saul. Saul had some good old days. Just one problem. He wasn't converted then. <laughs> had he carried that all out, he would have doomed the world into darkness. And I can promise you, in that day and time, Juda Judaism would not have flourished. Islam would have flourished when it came on the scene centuries later and would have swept up the whole world in its wake of blood, of religion by force. He forgot some things. He said, we've got to put that aside. And he talked, I count them as loss. And that's, you know, the, the, in other words, they're not, they're not worthy of loss. And then he said, I count them as rubbish. Now that's a, that's a kind, polite word to use in the scripture. Because the word means dung. All of my accolades, where are they, Paul? Flushed them down the toilet. But what about that? Flushed it down the toilet. Weren't you born? Flushed it down the toilet. I had a fellow call, contact me recently. We got into some issues. He's unstable. And he, he began to appeal about to his aristocratic background. My family's aristocratic. I come from... This was a long voicemail. I just kept my pearls in my pocket. I thought I'm not going to take another swing at Tar Baby here. But you want to tell a person like that, look around you. Our forefathers fought a war so that no aristocrats would run this country. You're on the wrong side of the ocean. Paul counted it. It's a redemptive look. Take a redemptive look, folks, at your past. See, I could go back and say, man, there was a time, I remember a time when, when Karen and I... Uh, took a young, group of young adults, newly married. There were eight or ten of them and we poured our lives into them and the Lord blessed and lo and behold, we looked up and there were a hundred or more, 150. It was a great time of flourishing, of conversions. That's my past. I can lean on my past. Why? Because there's a present. Let's look at this. He didn't wallow in his lost good old days. Rather, he said, I look at what lies ahead. He had a hopeful view of the future. So he had a redemptive look at the past, a hopeful view of the future. If you look at, at the new, Fox News, CNN, uh, radio, newspaper, 
you're not going to have a hopeful look at the future. You're going to say, you know, as, as it seems right now, our choices come election time are going to be arsenic or strychnine. Either one will kill you. Just depends on how you want to die. Who knows? Maybe arsenic will pick strychnine as his running mate. I don't know. But when you look at the Word, the promises of God, when you know what's coming for us, you have a hopeful view. He said, I look, I strain toward what is ahead. Look at this. I'm straining forward to what lies ahead. I'm pressing on. That's just looking at the future and handling the, the present. How does he handle the present? He doesn't handle the present passively. He doesn't handle the present grumblingly. He doesn't handle the present going around pointing out what's not getting done. What he wishes was this, wishes was that. He handles the present with a strained energy. Now look at this. It's a stretching out. It's an extending. I want to know, are you living a stretching out Christian life? Are you living a Christian life extending? My physical therapist is, is making me uh, get up on my own now, you know, go without crutches, without walker. Uh, we have some exercises where I won't try to show you today, uh, but I'm sitting in a chair just like this because this chair comes from my dining table, and he makes me get on the edge of this chair and lean forward with my hands and stand up and do that at least 10 times, up and down, up and down, without assistance. And I can tell you it, it hurts. It, the pain level intensifies quickly doing that. Jim Schrod knows about that, don't you, brother? But I'm str he's making me strain. Why? So that I'll get stronger. If I use a walker the rest of my days, then I will get really good at a walker. But I won't get stronger. And so for me, in the Christian life, do I want to have a Christian life where I'm an expert with a walker? Or do I want to strain? And all the muscles be fired, the quads start firing, the glutes start firing, all these things he's telling me that are, that are happening in my knee and explaining why there's so much pain when I strain. And yet strain I must. Brothers and sisters, in that analogy, strain you must. If, 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 you, can't, if you don't think of your Christianity as, as causing you to strain, to stretch, if you want to use to get out of your comfort zone, then, then it is a Christianity that's going to call you to complacency. And complacency will cultivate in you lethargy. He talks about pressing on, that word persecute again, toward this goal. There's a mark. Do you have a mark set for you for 2016? It's not a bad idea to write it down. You know, there's too many of us who do goal setting by taking an arrow and shooting it. And when it hits something, we go and draw the bullseye around it and say, look, I hit the bullseye. Well, if I can do that. In fact, I'm, I'm, I've been guilty of that, I promise you. But what if you put a, what if you put a, a realistic, redemptive mark of here, I, so-and-so Christian, want to be this to the Lord Jesus Christ, be this to my wife, to my family, my extended family, be this to my church family. I want to be used. I want to share the gospel with this many people. I want to reach out and, and try to disciple this many people. Set the goals. If you don't set them, uh, you always hit a mark you never make. It, Paul says, I'm, 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 there's a mark that I want to hit. And I want to win the prize. I want to, I want to be recognized by the Lord for finishing the race. What did he want to hear? Well done, good and faithful servant. I have made you steward and you have been a good steward of the things I've made you. To take, take, a, take inventory. What are you a steward of? You have a stewardship in this membership. How's your stewardship going there? A stewardship to your family. A stewardship to your neighbors, to your enemies, to the gospel. I want to win the prize for the upward call because you see, this kind of Christianity calls you upward. It doesn't allow you to stay planted, it doesn't allow you to stay the same. It calls you upward. It says, Come on up. Come on up. There's a day coming in my life in the near future when I'm going to be challenged to walk up those stairs. And yet you know something? I can't wait 
till I can walk up those stairs without teetering and tottering and without you holding your breath going, is he going to fall again? And without the, without the congregational relieved sigh when I don't. You know? There's this, this upward call is a noble call. Oh, I'm out of time. Um... And we're, I don't want to cut this short. We're going to take this up. Probably not next week because we're planning on an ordination and installation if we can get that to happen next Sunday. For some reason it doesn't, we'll get to conclude. If it does, then we'll enter February. With the rest of this, I want, you, I want you to hear the rest of this. This is too critical. We get the gist of what we said today. How are you dealing with your past? How are you dealing with the future? And what, what does your present look like that shows that redemptive reflection on the past and that hopeful look at the future? If your future has no hope, you're not looking at the gospel. You're looking at the American pundits. The gospel existed before America. It will exist after America. It existed before we were the land of the free. It will exist after we're in prison for our faith. The gospel always gives hope. And I want you to go away today with that. One thing. What if each member within the sound of my voice this morning would say, okay, Lord, I see it in your word, I'm convinced. This one thing, that's what I'm going to give my life to. One thing I'm going to give my life to. I'm reading a book called The Desperate Church. He talks in a part of that about how Jesus said he would build his church. And he makes the point that I've tried to make this morning that you don't stand back with arms folded passively to watch Jesus build his church. So he uses this acrostic on the word build, and I want to close with this. He said, what kind of church are you going to build along with Jesus? He said, think of the B as brokenness. Until a church assumes a position of humility, desperation, and brokenness, restoration cannot occur. It must be Jesus' church, not ours. Then the U for build is unity. A, a church must unify in the purpose and calling of Christ. The people must serve together. The I for innovation. Building implies change. We must change our methods while we never change our message. Then L for love. If we love God and then love our neighbors, we'll be a church that goes to and attracts hurting people. And D, dedication. It's not going to be easy. There's the strain, you see. Working with Jesus as he builds is hard. Sometimes grueling work. However, it's always worth it. Will you strain with me, 2016? Will you press on? Will you set those redemptive marks? Longing for the prize. Wanting to be called upward in the nobility of growing in grace and in Jesus Christ. Let's pray.